Let me tell you about the show's newest sponsor, Juniper Mountain Coffee. You can check them out at junipermountaintradingpost.com and check out everything that they sell. I really like what they say on their website. And guys, if you are a coffee connoisseur like me, this here American company that's not run by a bunch of wokesters might be worth checking out for you. What they say is, we roast coffee for those loyal to a lost way of life, those that never back down in the face of adversity, the ones that keep their word, treat people with respect, and still believe in the importance of hard work. We offer some of the best coffee in the world and look forward to earning a spot in your cup. And they have definitely earned a spot in my cup. Whether you like light roast, dark roast, ground already, or not ground, you just want to order it fresh. And they even have those little pod things for those of you that just make one cup at a time. I drink too much coffee for that, so I don't do that. And they also have a cold brew. But it's a great company, great story. Uh, You guys are going to dig these guys. Check them out at junipermountaintradingpost.com. Let them know the Western Huntsman sent you. This is that time of year when it's really time to turn up the heat on your scouting. We're going through summer. Season's going to be here before you know it. And I don't care if you're going after mule deer, whitetail, the mighty whoppity, whatever it is. Scouting is imperative and it makes it much easier when you use trail cameras where they are allowed. And uh, let me tell you something. I, I like trail cameras that are easy to use, functional, and have good quality pictures. That brings us to Spy Point. Spy Point trail cameras. You can check them out at spypoint.com. And it doesn't matter if you're looking to do one of the cell cams, like the Flex X or the Flex G36 or the LM2. They have some great deals on their website. Like right now, if you check them out, they've got some clearance cameras going on on the cell cams. You can also get a cell link that attaches to any regular cell camera and will uh, transmit pictures right to your phone. The other trail cameras, if you're way out in the backcountry and don't have phone service out there, the Force Pro S and the Force Pro are my go-to cameras. I absolutely love them. If you guys saw the pictures from this last bear season, they were really high-quality pictures, and they were all done with that Force Pro camera. So check it out, guys, at spypoint.com, and let them know the Western Huntsman sent ya. There exists a threat, from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive, and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Time Studio, brought to you by Eastman's Hunting Journals. And speaking of Eastman's, I got my pal Scott Reekers from Eastman's Hunting Journals on the line today, and uh, we're going to bounce all over um, several topics, but uh, really excited to get you on, brother. How you doing? Man, it's good to be here. It feels like it's been forever since we've actually recorded one. I think it's been over a year. It's been well it? over a year. I think we need to do it more often, in fact. We should, actually. Actually, we need to make it a regular thing, because um, with application season coming, we're like it is almost November and application season starts in December. Yeah, I know, man. It's it's going to be, and and I think that that is, uh, you know, people talk a lot about how to find an elk or how to shoot, an, uh, you know, an antelope or and whatnot, but there's not enough conversations about how to get a good tag. Uh, and that's something I struggle I with big time. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll get into that, but uh, I just wanted to kind of, you know, jump on with you. We haven't, again, we talk on the phone all the time, but we never actually record a conversation. So I I think it feels like we're always recording, but uh, this time we <laughs> yep. actually have the little light going and everything. And so I could see your smiling face. How are things in Powell, Wyoming? It is good. We have, we've actually had a, I'll call it a fairly normal fall as far as weather goes. We've had one, you know, one good solid stretch where it rained a bunch down low. They got a lot of snow up high, which was good for the elk hunters. You know, they were able to pick them out. It happened. It happened in elk season. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was really good for them. So I'm, I'm excited to see about uh, about how all, all the elk did. Hold on a second. 
<clears throat> you got a frog Man, in your throat, brother. I do have a frog in my throat. That was not my plan for the start of this podcast. Um, <laughs> so, but it's been a good fall here. Our hunt winners did really good in Colorado, um, which is always fun uh, to see those text messages. In fact, uh, you can see it on Eastman Social how that's happened. Um, mm-hmm. Dan, Dan Picard has had some good success, so there's going to be some good episodes on Beyond the Grid. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of big animals hitting the dirt. Brian Barney's also had a good fall, so a lot of the a lot of the people around here have done really well and had some good opportunities. Does does Brian and Dan never like ever have a bad season, or is it just like you know, <laughs> like it has been this year? These guys are awesome. You are you are not wrong. Now I'll say this, um, and bear this in mind. Okay, like. First world problems, all right? Uh-huh. Dan and a buddy went into the Wyoming wilderness, and it was a horseback hunt. They did really well. They both killed 340 bulls. That is like a season of a lifetime for, or a hunt of a lifetime for a lot of guys. Yeah. Well, Dan, last year, if you've been watching Beyond the Grid, Dan killed a bull that was pushing 390 and a 370 bull last year. Jeez, so, man. When you ask that question, yeah. And when you ask that question, like, you know, does he ever have a bad fall? I, you know, I can't remember one and we've worked together almost 10 years. So, yeah, some guys, you know, some guys are just like money. I I, I don't know mm-hmm. what it is. They're just when it, when it, you could, it's like putting money in the bank, you know, it's there. And, and when Dan and Brian go out, you know, I've got, I've got other friends that are like that, that are just, you just know yep. it's going to happen and it's going to be a huge thing. Uh, and, and then you've got guys like me that you can put money on the fact that you're going to fail. And that's pretty much what happens <laughs> to me in September. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's really funny. Bow hunting, I've reached a conclusion, is a is a creative art. And the guys yeah. who think like those animals do and do really well, um, they they just, they have a gift at it. And yeah, for sure. Um, but I will also say that in order to in order to really become a good bow hunter, um, you really have to commit to it as a craft. And you almost have like the guys I know that have gotten really good at bow hunting. The vast majority of them don't pick up a rifle later. Um, yeah. they've, they've committed that bow hunting is the only thing they're going to do. That is their only means means of kill. There are a few that are kind of an exception um, to that that I know. Uh, but those are few, those guys are few and far between the ones that are just just killers all around with all weapons um you know by by my own by my own admittal i am not the um the hardcore archer like i am an oper- an archery opportunist um i will take my bow out in the fall um and I, of course i want to kill but mm-hmm. like I'm not like Brian and Dan putting all of my focus into, into the month of September for, you know, archery elk. And then the opportunities that come for high country mule deer. I like, I like having a three, three and a half month season, being able to spread that out and looking for a lot of opportunities across the West. Yeah. I'm the same way, man. I, I I mean, don't get me wrong. I love bow hunting. There's something really special about bow hunting and, but I, and I've, I've talked about this a few times, but I'm not like one of those purists. Yeah, you know, yep. and it's like you get these you get these purists in different. I don't care if it's hunting, fly fishing is another one because you've you've got you've yes. got these dudes fly that are like bad. right. They'll only fly fish, and then amongst the fly fishermen, you'll have these purists that only dry fly. Yeah, use a dry fly, you know. It's a, <laughs> they 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 won't do anything subsurface, yeah. and they won't use strike indicators and all this stuff. And so, and I get that. I I don't I don't care if somebody wants to be like that. It's it's great for them. It's what it, that's that's mm-hmm. the beauty of being an outdoorsman is is you get to pick what path you're passionate about and pursue that. But for me, I'm passionate about all of it. I I do love to bow hunt. Yep. But I also love to rifle hunt. Um. And, and those are those are I, I they're they're different experiences. And I think that yes. I would I would get bored just be and it's just my because that's my personality. I would get bored if I was just trying to be a purist one way or the other. Um and, and you know, archery hunting for September elk has been like this I this podcast has like been bad luck for me because ever since I started it, I, I haven't uh I haven't <laughs> like actually killed a bull and got to recover it. You know, that I had that deal last year where I, I killed that bull and my truck burned down and I couldn't recover it. 
And, and this year I had a lot of opportunities and because of last year, I was super <laughs> cautious about shots I was going to take. And, uh, yeah. you know, I had a lot of opportunities, but I, I just, I just didn't feel good about the shots. So I came out empty handed, but that's okay because yeah. I'm not a purist. <clears throat> Scott. So next week, uh, my Idaho rifle season starts for elk and I've got like four days mm-hmm. to, to try to track yep. down a bull and, um, we'll see how it goes. And that's the beauty of it, you know? I'll break well, out that savage. That's the nice part about <laughs> absolutely break out that savage. In fact, I used my uh, my new Savage 65 PRC this last week on that antelope hunt. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It it worked. It worked flawlessly. And then we also had I you know, by my own admittal, I've used silencers before or suppressors before, but I've not used them extensively. And so being able to use that, um, it was really funny. We get to the range at, w- at the outfitters and he, Fonzie goes, Oh, we've got civilized people hunting with us this week. <laughs> because we're using silencers. And right. so that was a really cool, really cool piece of the equation. Um, we weren't blowing people's, you know, eardrums out with these, you know, with these, these, these incredibly large rifles, anything like that. You know, Todd was shooting a, a seven millimeter. So, you know, it's fast gun, but my six, five PRC is plenty of gun too. Um, oh, yeah. Todd was probably a little overkill for, you know, for antelope, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but I was really happy with how the, with how the whole hunt played out. The six, five PRC performed perfectly, did exactly what it was supposed to. I mean, we've got the video footage where I hit it, you know, behind the shoulder, a little high, but it was laying down. Uh-huh. Um, some people won't take that shot, but we, we were close. It was less than a hundred yards on, on my shot. And oh, so, nice. um, I got, yeah, I got, got laid down, was able to shoot it, you know, and, um, you can watch it in the video gets hit, head falls over. It didn't even, you know, it didn't even get up, didn't run, nothing like that. There was no chance for, you know, adrenaline to get in that meat. So I'm really looking forward to the antelope sausage. It should be really, really good. And, you know, on that note, how, how's Fonzie doing, man? For for those of you he's listening. He's doing good. Yeah. Fonzie Haskell, is a, he's been on the show and uh, he's a friend of mine. He's a friend of Scott's. And uh, he had a he had a pretty bad accident, ATV accident this <laughs> summer. Uh, I think it was like chasing cows or something. And Yep. Um, anyway, so he's doing good, up and moving pretty good. How How's that all that going for him? So he and I had a, you know, obviously several opportunities to sit down and talk and have good conversations. And, um, best part was that he's up and moving. Um, he's moving around well. Um, he's, he's able to do, uh, do a lot of things. He's able to do, you know, he works on a ranch as well as runs, uh, runs his outfitting business. And yeah. so being, you know, being, being able to get up and move and do those sort of things. It like, they were worried, um, like the ranch hands that were with him while they were moving cattle that saw it, they were really worried about him. Like they were worried he they were going to pull the four wheeler off on a dead guy. Yeah. Um, and now he, he ended up having a, um, you know, some just fairly major issues, you know, I'm, I'll at some point you can have him on again and he can explain what happened, you know, and tell that whole story, but he's up and moving around, um, was able to, you know, be a fully, you know, fully functioning outfitter and guide this fall, which is what he was hoping for. And we had a fantastic experience with him. He, he works hard and does a good job and seeing him there and able to do that was even better. Oh, that's awesome, man. I, I was really, uh, pulling for Fonzie because he's, you know, he's just one of those like salt of the earth kind of dudes really like Mm -hmm. Fonzie. Uh, and you know, I, I definitely, definitely looking forward to one day going out and, and hunting. We, we talked about me coming out and hunting mule deer with him, uh, at some point. And so, um, and that accident could have been a lot worse. So he must be living yes, right. Man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, so it, it could have been a lot worse. I, I was, yeah. um, I, I got to be around a, co- a couple of his guides were also the ranch hands that were, were there when it happened. Um, and so I got to hear from their perspective, what they saw and they said it was, it was a bad deal. They didn't know what they were going to be walking up on. Oh, and, man, that's tough. Um, how bad the situation was going to be. So, but, um, but here know, we are. Definitely talking a lot of about, answered prayers. Yeah. Yeah. Answer yeah. prayer. And, uh, you know, you, you were talking about you hunting with him. I'm, I'm slightly distracted. Yep. I got this, you know, being in this new room here in the, in the house where I've got this makeshift studio started, I've got a window to the back and, uh, apparently my chickens have gotten out of their run <laughs> and they're like looking in the window, man, it's really distracting. And so I don't oh. know how the heck they're getting out either. It's pissing me off. I've done so much work on this coop and they're still figuring out how to get around. 
get out. And what's even worse on top of that, Scott, is like it's a big run. They have they have like what people that live in the suburbs that those backyards yeah. that people have, you know, that that's mm-hmm. how big their little chicken run is. And and it's great. It's like bear proof, everything. But they still want to get out and come <laughs> spy on me in the window. That uh that's you know, you're gonna have to post a picture on social media just to get, you know, just to tell people I, about this I was, happened. Though, I was sitting of, staring in the window. Yeah. That's funny actually. I was thinking about that, but I'd be embarrassed. I the the lady we bought this house from <laughs> She left all sorts of junk. I mean, just mm-hmm. just uh, she was a big time gardener. So I've got all this like yeah. crap that was piled up in the uh, greenhouse. And I, <laughs> I've got it piled up outside the window on top of the deck. And that's the the garbage is what the chickens are standing on peering in the window at me because I think they can hear my voice. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't want to take a picture of it and show the show the junk in my backyard, man. <laughs> that's funny. So. Actually, we. <laughs> We had, um, when we moved into our house uh, uh-huh. and I don't know, I probably, I probably shouldn't say things about this cause I'm sure, you know, the next people who buy our house from us someday when we move out of it, will complain about, you know, call me a DIY disaster. Um, <laughs> but for some reason we bought, we bought this house in 2014 and like it was our first house as a married couple. I'd bought houses before, but my wife never had. Yeah. And so we, we buy this place. And people before us had done a lot of remodeling. And so inside of oh, it, no. there were these walls. Yes, there were, they, some of the stuff made sense. Like they had knocked out a wall in the kitchen to create a bar. Makes total sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and they put tile on, on the bar. Makes sense. Okay. Some of the stuff made sense, but other stuff did not. Every wall had been textured. And it looked like the inside of a Mexican restaurant, you know, those big ridges and, and Oh yeah, half, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. They had done that to they almost, every room upstairs. Oh no, man. That's tough to get rid of yes. too. Like they make it look like almost oh, that stucco looking Adobe style. Yes. Yeah, I know what yes. you're talking about. Yeah. And so rough. for some like and but the thing was it wasn't like a southwestern vibe in the house. It was just like I don't know if it's supposed to be modern artwork or what, <laughs> you know, but, but they had done that. And the funnier part was they hadn't pulled the trim off to do it. So there's like this big, like big ridge of plaster above it, uh-huh. you know? And so uh-huh. I had to fill in a whole bunch of stuff. Like I worked a lot of construction in college and then, um, I've done a lot of remodeling. I framed um, after college for a while, like when yep. I was working part-time at the church I was at. So, I don't want to say I have a lot of experience, but I've got enough to be dangerous. And I was like, what in the world? And so I've had, I, the only way I could get that off was you knocked the ridges down, like the ridges on it. And then Uh it had exposed plaster. And then you had to spray it with your little spray gun. And then you just knocked it off a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. I had to do it one room at a time. And then I had to retexture most of the walls. I'll bet that took forever, man. I've been in that house 10 years and we finally have the upstairs complete. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it, man. That is how long it took us to do that. I so, am not, I am not but, looking forward to this whole remodel thing. I, it's funny you say that because we, we bought this house and on the outside, you know, it looks like your traditional log slash cedar sided house. It's like this lodgy Montana looking thing. Yeah. And uh really cool looking. It, need, it needs a good staining on the outside, but other than that, real lodgy looking. But then you walk inside yes. and it does have that southwest feel. It does not match the outside at all. <laughs> and it's got these weird arches in some of the walls and some of the like hallway entryway things. And my wife despises yeah. these arches. Uh, and it's got this, it's actually really nice Mexican tile uh it, that uh kind of flows with the arches or whatever and and my again <laughs> my wife hates this southwest look thing she oh, wants it back funny. to the montana lodge feel so i'm going to be ripping up tile and getting rid of arches and it is just going to be a ton of work but i'm pretty excited for this room man it's going to be the actual new broken time studio and i'm going to i'm going to make it look like that eastman's room you guys have there in powell yep. where we met at that cool table can you guys send me yep. one of those tables <laughs> <laughs> you know that Mike's is up for that right table. oh i'm sure 100 <laughs> uh, 
that that was actually um there's an old historical picture somewhere of the first building they had the eastman's building they had in thermopolis and that was the sign that was out in front and oh really so, uh, yes and i don't remember i can't remember whether it was a project that ike did early on working for the company um but they took that sign and they um made it into a table but then Ike took the table or the top off uh-huh. and he had it epoxied because um, we used to have a big plastic cover on it. But now we've actually got it epoxied so that, you know, it's, it's, it's real yeah. nice to be able to, it's easier to clean and then you don't worry about stuff falling in or anything like that. So yeah. it's, it's a pretty cool table to have there, but we did, um, you know, that studio, it, the studio has been really nice. It, it matches our personality and, and, and feel yeah. a lot. So when we go in there and record, um, so, and then we were able to add some lighting and make it a, make it a place that we, we all really enjoy spending time in there. Cause we spend a lot of time in there together. I mean, just oh, look yeah. at when you came down and visited with us, you spent a whole day in that room. So oh, yeah. I love the idea of remodeling and making spaces that match your, um, you know, match your personality and, and, and feel that's important to me. Yeah, for sure. This studio and, and the, the listeners that are interested, I, I will bore you to death with like as as we get <laughs> updates and, and progress made on the studio, I'll take a bunch of videos and put them on the Instagram. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, including I, I clearly I've never recorded this time of day and I've got a bunch of sun coming in those blind, uh, the window over there. It needs blinds. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of work, man. Just a lot of work. So um, good work. Though. Good work. So, so yeah, other than that, uh, it's, it's nice to catch up with you finally, because it's, you know, I've been in the field. I spent most of September in the field. Uh, didn't record a lot. Um, I'm like still getting my, it's, it's funny when I spend that much time away from the microphone, it feels like I have to kind of relearn how to record podcasts. I feel really rusty, yeah. uh, especially <laughs> that first one. I was like, man, I don't even know what to talk about. Uh, Cause I was, I was still upset about how September turned out for me. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, I take September pretty, uh, pretty personal. And so it's just yep. nice to be back in the saddle, but, um, let's talk about tag hub 2.0 for a minute, man. Actually, you know, before, before we do that, it just, it, for, for anybody that didn't hear our first episode and might not know who you are, tell everybody what you do for Eastman's and, and, uh, a little bit about you. Okay. So, um, officially I have, have a, have a couple of titles. One is the podcast lead podcast group lead. So any of the podcasts that happen here at Eastman's, I am point of contact for our hosts. Um, I work with our, our video production team who helps with a lot of the production. I also work with our uh, social media team very intimately, um, to make sure that all of our podcasts are getting promoted and pushed out on a regular basis. Um, another piece of the equation and Jim's gotten to deal with both sides of this, you know, being part of the Eastman's brand as Western Huntsman is, is um, I do business development. Um, Sometimes that can mean um, doing a lot of research and building strategic partnerships and the the business to business relationships um, more than just, sometimes they're, they're more than just an advertiser relationship. And that's not to discount advertisers and partnership relationships. Those are significant, ridiculously important. Mm -hmm. We're, we're talking about relationships like bringing a Western Huntsman into the Eastman's brand and, and helping grow that because we believe in what Western Huntsman is uh, and being able to develop a partnership like that and grow, you know, help, you know, we believe in the Western Huntsman. We believe in the podcast. We believe in Jim. And so that was one of those things we thought there's a strategic partnership. So it was my job to build that strategic partnership and then also help, um, you know, help our, help our team here be able to, um, you know, work with Jim and bring this entertaining product that is, that is educational to, to the masses. That's what business development is on our end. Yeah. Um, and so that, that is one of the pieces that, that I really help with and do a lot of work, work on, um, you know, if you ever think that you want to do business development, you better be okay failing nine out of 10 times. Um, it's just, that's just how it works. I know yeah. they say that that happens a lot in, in business, um, but the simple reality is, is that you will have a lot of good ideas that sometimes you just can't sync, um, with, you know, other brands or things that you want to work with and do, but the times that you get it to work and the times that you are able to make it happen are worth it. And that's what, that's, what's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I love developing and building relationships. I love helping people succeed. Um, 
you know, for instance, you know, uh, I haven't gotten to say this to you, but I think we talked briefly about it, but you know, you got one of your best months as far as podcast listeners ever that, that makes me excited that I got to, you know, be a part yeah, and man. support that role and help, help with Eastman. So that, those are the things that make me tick, um, as a, as a person, you know, seeing other people be successful helping, you know, I like to, I like to be there in the background and, and help with that. I don't mind getting, you know, like getting up on stage at one of our live events. I've done that in my whole life, play guitar, sure. um, you know, worked in churches. That doesn't bother me, but that's not something that I, I don't scribe for that. I know some people that really drives them and that's fine. Um, you know, but that's not necessarily what drives me. Um, to, you know, or what I consider successful, you know, cause I know for every person that's on stage, there are 15 to 20 other people that have helped them get to that, you know, get to that space. And I, and I like yeah, having absolutely. a role in both of it and seeing it. And so that's what, to me, that's what business development is, is you help grow and you expand, um, areas. And then you also help implement, implement the systems and get people started and working on all the different, um, different pieces that are there. So there's a lot of team coordination. Um, you know, sometimes the, uh, sometimes the staff here would probably tell you I'm really good at communicating. Other times they would probably tell you, and I don't know what he's thinking with this, you know, at, you know, he wants to add another podcast, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, we have things like that, that happen too, but that's just part of life and part of the, um, you know, part of the experience and growth. So that's what I do here. Um, yeah. and I'm sure everybody's like, how does that relate to hunting? Well, that's, that's where tag hub came in. So, well, and it's, you know, it's Eastman's hunting journal. So it, it has everything to do with hunting, but I, I want to, before we get into uh, the tag hub, um, I want to point out that, that what you were saying there kind of triggered my, my memory here. Uh, I think, I think I've surpassed the one year mark of being with Eastman's hunting yes. journals. Um, yes, and you have. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's about I, I I don't know if it was August or September of last year, but anyway, it was it was sometime in the late summer last year. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been awesome, man, since we first met there in Powell, Wyoming. And and uh, I got to see all those gigantic mule deer you guys have down there when I came down to visit. <laughs> yep, there are a few. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, guys got a few uh, animals in the entryway. But, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, for yeah, sure, he stops and stares at when they come in. So yeah, so, but yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been it's been fun, man. I I like working because I I I just started doing a podcast, right, and just wanted to talk about hunting and the future of hunting and and what I see is problematic as as we kind of roll into the future. But uh, I I didn't know anything about the hunting industry or or the hunting space, and <laughs> it was nice working with guys that actually know um you know the ins and outs of the industry and and just kind of helping me guide guide that it's it's been really helpful for me i wouldn't have had that giant month i, I think it was august you're talking about that uh those, those uh downloads we had which which is thanks to all you guys listening um it was a it was a huge month for for the western huntsman podcast and and most of that is thanks to eastman's um getting us getting us out there except i didn't know you well, guys were going to expect me to write articles for the magazine and i'm a terrible <laughs> writer <laughs> we don't expect you to write articles we well we do we do have you write articles but todd todd can make anybody sound pretty and yeah, still sound true. like you, you know, that, so that's good you know, that's he does it. have a knack for that man <laughs> so he does well tag uh or i'm sorry tag hub 2.0 what what's different <laughs> well a, explain what tag hub is for anybody that doesn't know that's been living under a rock uh, mm -hmm. And then we can explain the difference between Tag Hub and Tag, Tag Hub 2.0. I've been talking about Hoffman Boots for a very long time. You guys know that I'm a huge fan of this company. And it's not just the great products that they make. It's the story behind the company and the people that run it. This generational family of shoemakers right here in North Idaho makes some of the best hunting boots and pack boots and lineman boots and all your boot needs right in one place at HoffmanBoots.com. For us hunters, I highly recommend the Explorer. And I don't care if you're running in the 6-inch or the 8-inch or the 10-inch. Personally, I, I love my 8-inch Explorers. They've got the Vibram sole. They are totally waterproof. There's no break-in period. Guys, you can't go wrong with Hoffman Boots because you get all that without breaking the bank. So check them out at HoffmanBoots.com and use promo code all caps lock Huntsman 10 at checkout for 10% off and find out why I have been wearing my Hoffman boots for years and years. 
Don't be one of those people that have it in their mind that Savage Arms is the same firearms that your grandpa was running around with 40 years ago. It's not. Big game hunting rifles that you can count on. I love my Savage Firearms. I have got the Savage 110 Hunter, uh, and my daughter is uh, pretty happy with this 110, 110 Apex Hunter XP. Um, the AccuTrigger is a really interesting little piece to this firearm, and it's a new piece of technology that uh, if you've never tried one, you should, because it'll make you more accurate. It's it's a much easier, higher quality firearm than anything else I've got out there, and I've, I've got a lot of firearms, guys, and so if you're in the market for a new hunting rifle, make sure you visit SavageArms.com, because I promise you, you're going to find something that is accurate, easy to handle, easy to use, long range, functional, just a high quality weapon that you could take to the field and have a lot of confidence that when it, the time comes, you've got that Savage backing you up and you're going to be notching a tag. Check it out, SavageArms.com. Let them know the Western Huntsman sent you. Thanks, guys. So Tag Hub was... Um, was an expansion of the journals, uh, the MRS and the journals, which is the members research section. Um, and we're actually about to have the 200th issue of the hunting journal. That's actually going to go to print next week. And it'll, it, it'll be arriving on doorsteps in November, which that's incredible in and of itself to do 200 issues of a hunting journal is, is incredible, especially when milestone. everybody's saying, yeah, when everybody's saying print is dead. Um, mm -hmm. and that part is crazy, but the evolution started with Mike Eastman. He was traveling to trade shows and, and, and doing things of that nature while he was getting started. And one of the things he discovered was there were all these guys. And I think it, he might've been at the show in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there were all these guys who didn't know anything about applying out West. And because they didn't know, he's like, well, I'm just going to put together a pamphlet and show them everything they need to know. And so he put together this pamphlet and it flew off his table like hotcakes. And so then he's like, I think I could turn this into a, into a magazine. And so that's, that's how that happened. But he kept mm -hmm. including all this information on how do you hunt? How do you plan to hunt out West? And, <clears throat> and pretty soon that turned into the members research section, which that was, we took all 11 Western states and we dove into them and just did analysis and research and helped people understand who and what they are um, as far as your applications, how to do it. Nevada, I write the MRS for Nevada, and Nevada is a very different animal than Wyoming, which Wyoming is a very different animal than Idaho. And Montana, okay, Montana is a little bit easier to understand for the most part, as long as you understand the difference between preference and bonus points. Yeah. So, yeah. Montana's and, tricky and, to me, man, but it, I'm used to the well, simplicity and, of Idaho. <laughs> well, the simplicity of Idaho is that everything is hundred percent random, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've got, well, random. And then the other piece of the equation is that it's quote unquote, even over the counter for general hunts for, mm -hmm. um, for non-residents. I, I don't buy that. It's actually over the counter anymore. It's stand your place in line. Um, the way that that disaster is going with, with since they capped off how many um, non-residents can hunt in each general area, because that's a different, yeah. they need to turn it into a draw. I mean, I, I, I know that's a it, kind of a headache, but it, it, it's a, I, I don't know if, I think what they need to do is smooth out the non-resident purchase um sequence uh or or, or the, the process that they use because yeah you get you get all these people on one website at one time obviously it's going to crash and that's what happens everybody you know they yeah. lose their place in line and they or, or they have to sit there for hours you know their their number is fourteen thousand four hundred and fifty six kind of thing and you know it's just there's got to be a better way um because i i hate the idea of draw uh, a draw system and especially for the state of idaho that doesn't have it uh, it, it, again, you know, I moved, I moved, uh, five minutes across the border and now I'm in Montana. So not, not my issue, but I do have, I do have my lifetime hunting license over there. So, um, anyway, I'm getting us sidetracked here. It's okay. I mean, it's all part of the process. Yeah. I mean, with, with Idaho, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the problem is, I shouldn't even call it a problem. 
the challenges that there are so many people who who want to do it now because a lot of guys are searching for opportunity and that's unfortunately i think you have to set it up as a draw in order to do that because the only thing that is a that might correct that and i say might because that's a big um, piece of the equation is if there is a change in our economy where you know, we're a negative change in our economy, which I don't want to happen, you know, but generally speaking, um, when the economy is, is a little rougher, it's harder to justify non-resident tag prices. It is. So and and I don't, that, the, the way things are going, uh, you know, under the current administration and, and w- when you, when you look at how long gas prices have been this high and, and interest rates are where they're at, uh, the direction of, of this, um, uh, uh, bizarre leftist ideology the 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 economy's gonna go south at some point we just don't yeah. know when you know we're already seeing it in the construction industry especially on the residential side you know it's 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 gonna go south this is always what happens you know it it, it is and and i have to remind myself that this this isn't the worst i've lived through as far as an economy goes 2008 was worse oh yeah um, you know, yeah, you know, so that number one, um, that's there. Then number two, I have to remind myself that every time I talked about 2008 being bad, you know, and I'm just, I just turned 40. So quote unquote, millennial, barely a millennial, whatever. Um, but, but dad will remind me, he's like, well, I was paying almost 20% on my first house that I bought in Wyoming. Yeah. You know, and he's like, there's a little duplex. And he said, so, you know, you don't remember, but there were lines at the gas station. So, Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how, how all that plays out here in the near future. My, my gut, my gut on that stuff says that it's going to get worse, but we will see what happens with, um, this, Basically, the stability of the world is what's going to drive our economy for the next little while. Unfortunately, yeah. you, I think you nailed it, man. I think you nailed it. Uh, a change in administration would is going to be is going to be a key point. Uh, the 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 stability that we're seeing overseas, you know, between you've got Ukraine, you've got Israel, and the and the Gaza Strip going on right now. You've got China chomping at the bit to to take Taiwan back uh over as if they've you know always owned it or whatever and i don't know the history with that actually so i won't speak out of turn but yeah, there's a lot of instability that one, the history on that one's easy that's there you know when the chinese revolution happened with the communists mm-hmm. you had the you had the um basically people who were like-minded with their voting system like us and you had the communists all the people that had the like-minded government like a freedom loving freedom loving style of government they ended up on taiwan and then the communists got on mainland yeah 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 so makes that's, sense. i mean that's really that's a really dumbed down way of explaining it way more minutiae and things like that but if you want to under if you want a very basic understanding that's that's what it is i are, how how worried and i don't mean to get us so off topic but like how worried are you in terms of i'll, I'll give you a great example man i i'm a huge history buff and when i look at <laughs> When I look at what triggered, for example, the Civil War or the you know World War One and World War Two, it was all these smaller conflicts that kind of materialized into a greater conflict, and they became world wars or they became what what we know as the Civil War. Um, and, and I think about that kind of stuff, and you know, I, I've I've been to a war, uh, a couple of them, in fact, and and I I don't understand why humanity always finds itself going back into the you know terrible thing that is war because i I think a lot of people uh, like there's the hollywood version of war you know and then there's what war really is and 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 i i just am i've got such a bad taste in my mouth for it i i find it difficult to advocate for any kind of justification for it the, the, like to me, I always feel like there's 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 got to be another way, but I, I'm seeing all this these little fires pop up throughout the world, and and the way America is responding and reacting to them, and our 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 leadership, and I don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans, like we can't even figure out who the next Speaker of the House is going to be. It's a total shit show. Our leadership has just failed, in my opinion. I, I just how worried is Scott Reekers? Well. 
All right. So let's break this down into into a few pieces. Cause I'm a history nerd too. I'm like I, I love history. Like I was actually I, I double majored in college and I was actually six hours away and I could have pressed the issue because of how many um how many Christian history classes I took through part of my practical theology degree. Uh-huh. I could have pressed the issue and, and walked away with a minor in 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 history if I wanted to. Um I just chose not to I didn't have time for doing that as a senior in college. Sure. Um, sure. But I was only six credit hours away from getting that minor. Um, So number one, um, per capita, we are living in the most peaceful time in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't, we don't talk about that nearly enough because if you, if you take a look at the mainstream media and the news, you will see that you will see all these conflicts that you're talking about. And that's not to discount them. That's not to say that they aren't violent, that they aren't bad, because um, they are they're atrocities. There's mm-hmm. there's no um, two ways about that. So, number one, we are living in the most civilized time that that the earth and humanity has ever seen. Um, number two is you know like, <laughs> and I am I am a believer in Jesus Christ and. So for my my sake, I am not worried about it in the sense of my life is a short time frame here and life really begins after death. Yeah. So my perspective on that is is such that worry isn't the right term. Like if someone walked in today um, and were to kill me for being a Christian, I know where I'm going. I'm taken care of. Um, yeah. you yeah. know, so, so I don't worry in that sense. Now, what concerns me is for my kids, um, because what we're setting up and leaving with a lot of these ideologies, um, and what we're, you know, what we are doing that is potentially, um, setting them up for much harder times in the future, that, that is what really, um, really worries me um you know a lot of people i i you know i'll use this as an example but um you know history wise i've i've studied the book um or i've studied the history of israel a lot there's going to be conflict there until until the end of time Mm -hmm. it's unfortunately that but like, you know, and, and that's, I, I've got, you know, and I, I say that having had conversations with Muslim friends, um, mm-hmm. I have met and spoken to a, um, a young man from Saudi Arabia at length. Um, we had many conversations about, um, you know, the differences in our faith and things of that nature. And we walked away without wanting to kill each other. Okay. So like, you know, I know conversations like that are possible. However, the ex- he is um, he's an example of someone that can come and have a conversation. But the extremes that are present on all sides of uh, of those factions are the things that that drive that. So, and if you actually were to set a timeline of the history of Christian Christianity and mm-hmm. a history of Islam right next to each other, put 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 them at this is starting point zero, um, and match them up. In any movement, there is a time frame where you become there is a there's usually some form of violence that happens that comes with it, um, and we're actually in that same. If you were to match those time frames up, the time frame we are at in the Middle East right now with Islam as a religion as a whole matches up exactly where um, I hate to I hate to say this because where. It was. I don't want because I don't want to call it Christianity because the Crusades were not Christianity. Um, they were not. They were not what was what was taught. Yeah. Jesus never yeah. once said retake the Holy Land. Um, yeah. You know, he commanded us to live at peace, live at peace with everyone. So, mm-hmm. um, but quote unquote, what a lot of people recognize as Christianity across the world. Because I, I don't want to throw the Catholic Church under the bus because it wasn't necessarily even the Catholic Church. It was a government a government system that was the papal society that ran the crusades. Um, yeah. And there, and there was nothing Christian about what was done with the crusades. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, 
Kingdom of Heaven, that movie was completely off on everything that um, everything that was a crusade. It took like four different crusades and and st- stuck them all into yeah, one. Yeah, I've heard that. that. I've never even seen that one. It, it's it's a good movie um, in the sense that you will be entertained. You will get a sense for what the crusades were mm-hmm. um, and weren't. But it jammed about four crusades into one. Um, but the thing that they did nail is there were a lot of people that lived in that region. They just wanted to live. They yeah. didn't want to, yeah, yeah. you know, they didn't want to be, um, you know, they didn't want to be subject to, you know, whatever King happened to be coming over from, um, you know, from the West that was going to enforce their version of government or even, um, you know, whoever the, um, the Muslim Caliph was at the time that was going to, you know, going to rule. They just wanted to live. You know, they just wanted to be able to make a living, raise their family. And that's the problem is that there are a lot of people, both in Israel and in Gaza, um, that aren't going to have that opportunity because of this conflict. It's the same thing in Ukraine. You know, there are a lot of people who are negatively affected. And my line on, tie this back to my line on war. How did we get here from Tag Hub? Um, My my line on war. (laughs) Welcome to the Western uh, Huntsman. (laughs) (laughs) Um, my line on war is always all right so if we were to back up and look at this at 30,000 feet um, if if one which side if it stopped fighting would the other stop fighting if that makes sense so for instance um, if you look at Look at the situation in Ukraine. Do I think Ukraine is is corrupt and there is a lot of things going on there that are absolutely bad? 100%. But if Ukraine were to stop fighting, Russia would run it over. Yeah. And so that shows me who the aggressor is. Um, And so that is my line of how do we, who do we know who to defend? I don't agree with us sending a ton of military money over there. I don't, I don't. I don't like that. I think we're bankrupting ourselves doing that. Totally. But as far as ridiculous, as, as far as as far as some level of moral high ground, that's, I guess how I've had to, had to do that. So for Israel, um, is a little weird because who, who drew first blood, you know, it wasn't Israel. it, It wasn't Israel on this occasion. Um, but, the argument gets made and, and I'm not like I'm pro Israel. Okay. So like, yeah. but the, the I, I kind of conversation 100. Yeah. I, I'm pro Israel right, right now. Cause they are, they did not start this. And a lot of the people that were in Israel were people that were living there before Israel was established as a country post world war two. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the, to me, the thing is right now, if, if, if Hamas were to quit fighting, Israel would, 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 we wouldn't have this because this Hamas started this, this particular conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, Now the argument then gets made, and this is one of those weird things about Eastern culture. Timelines don't matter. Like revenge doesn't have a timeline in a lot of Eastern cultures. So for instance, um, this is still an extension of fighting the crusades in, in a lot of Muslims minds. And so that's part of what we're, we're trying to overcome but these people that are just living there on both sides that just want to live there, they're the, they have the same issue that they had, um, that they had clear back in the crusades where there were Muslims who just wanted to live. They, you know, they, yeah. they were there, there were, um, there were Christians there during the crusades who just wanted to live. They had always lived in that region. Um, they had houses, they had livelihoods. There were Jews there that had livelihoods, um, there for, thousands of years even at that point so to me that's where like i i've never fought a war i did not serve um but i i've now lived enough life where i've met a lot of people who have i've also met a lot of people i went to rwanda and saw the effects of the genocide um you know so that yeah if you want to talk about real world that's real world when you see there are people walking around missing limbs and you know they were cut off with the shit can't even imagine uh, I mean, just, this is a- yeah yeah. So anyway, all that just all that just to say, you know, from my from my perspective, number one is messy. You will never get a good answer. You will never feel like you made one hundred percent the right decision when you send troops into war. You're hoping that you're doing it to protect innocent lives. Um, and if you if you jump in on the side that, generally speaking, if you jump in on the side that 
you know, if the other one were to stop, it fixes the problem. Then I think that's, to me, that's where you draw a line, but I don't advocate for jumping in. I don't want to see our troops in, in Ukraine yeah. or in Israel or, you know, I feel like it gets, far out I, it, it, it gets messy if we do. I, I, I just, I feel like that would be the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm often troubled, Scott, by the thought of, again, a couple of historic history nerds. There are very few exceptions to the concept that wars are started by people who seek to uh, expand their power or expand their wealth or their territory or their land, you know, whatever. There are a few exceptions to that. And uh, when I'm uh, what what I was going to say about being troubled is I'm a firm believer that that mankind, males specifically, are are born with this natural spirit to be a warrior. That's that's why little boys like to play war, and 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 this this is why sometimes the, just the nature of humans in general, um, in in like modern societies like we live in today in America, we we forget that, and and we have we have these these parents that want to forbid any kind of pretending of violence of of children or or not let them play with you know fake weapons or guns or you know people get really upset about that and been out of shape and i think that that's misguided because that is what is natural and so there's that element to it but there's also this other element that i i can't help but wonder if every country on on god's earth had the the setup uh governmental system of of which the the pursuit was freedom and and this uh, pursuit to to achieve whatever destiny that individual set for themselves, and that that only comes from freedom and liberty. That only comes from freedom, oh. where the the pursuit isn't to expand one's power, the, because the government is is elected by the people and it's temporary by nature. So expanding the power of a government doesn't really do any individual any real good thing, and so. That's why I, I think in a lot of cases, again, there are exceptions to this, but um, America has always been a force for good uh, to, mm-hmm. you know, stop people uh, from from warring other nations or, or, or you know, whatever, uh, from a sense of expanding their power. You know, in, in many now America has also been guilty of doing that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we could talk about the Indian Wars and the and the war with Mexico and and, yep. and things like that. We could certainly talk about that. But uh, in a lot of cases, you know, we we're the only country to send massive amounts of armies, um, to fight against itself to free other men. You, you know, there, there's there's no other country that has done that. Yep. And and so, I, I, I this is a lot of rambling, but it, it's to say that if I I wish there was a way to get a get rid of tyranny in the world tyranny mm-hmm. and and this this uh dictatorship mentality and ideology because this is what always seems to get us into trouble as humans where yeah. we start killing each other um how's that for getting off topic of tab tag hub <laughs> it is but that that's okay i mean it's, it's not the western <laughs> huntsman unless there's something controversial so it's right you know that's I, right I, I, have, I have talked a little bit about Jesus. We've talked about freedom. We've talked about the hot spots in the world. Okay, we're good. We, yep. we, we've hit okay. our yeah, uh, yep. yeah. We've yep. hit all the controversial things. So and killing uh, tyranny. That's that's right, buddy. Uh, okay, <laughs> so going back, going back to Tag Hub. Let's let's shift back to to Tag Hub here. Um, <clears throat> what is Tag Hub? First of all, uh, there, I'm sure there's people so that listening what don't we know did. what it is. Yeah. So what we did is we we sat down and we looked at um, the members research section. And, and I can use this as an example with um, the state of Nevada. I was only able to put in about 20 percent of the actual hunts into the print magazine, because if I were to put every single hunt in the print magazines and do an analysis on every one of them, um, just on Nevada, there would probably be about a magazine and a half. Yeah. Um, so we were just limited on space. So we could only put the biggest there. And we said, but I'm doing, I have to figure out what the best ones to put in the magazine were anyway. So why, why aren't we putting this out somewhere? I had to do the work. It just wasn't getting published. And that's rather frustrating. Um, so what we did is we took it and we said, okay, we're going to take this member's research section and we're going to put it into a form that allows people to sort and look at all the ratings and look at, okay, this is a hunt that fits me. It fits my personal style. Um, and so with that, we came up with tag hub 1.0. 
Now, with Tag Hub 1.0, we had a very good desktop experience. But we know that most guys do most of their hunting research on their desktop. And so we said that we're going to we're going to run with this for a little while and we're going to we're going to do a lot of research and see how we can expand and grow. Well, the biggest thing that we noticed is we found ourselves wanting to do more on mobile research wise because I started working on Tag Hub in end of 2018 beginning of 2019 and then it came to market in 2020 Mm -hmm. um and so and then and so we said okay what can we take what can we improve what can we even build better and so with all that in mind um 2.0 was an expansion that okay mobile technology has grown a lot and we can we can make this our phones are actually getting bigger so we could develop Mm -hmm. a mobile system but we said we didn't want to just we didn't want to just have all this data there and make it something that, um, you know, make it something that was just seemed unsurm- insurmountable. We wanted to make it for the average Joe because 1.0 was definitely for the research nerd. Like if you love to research, that's what it was for. Mm-hmm. But we said, you know what? There are a lot of guys out there who want to do research, but they don't want to geek out on the numbers. They want a very... Um, a very basic system that allows them just to see very quickly, where should I apply? What do I have the points for and how do I get there? So in came, um, I was introduced, I don't know, it was sometime in 2021 um, to a guy named uh, Bill Thompson. And um, he's fresh out of the military. And he, he said, hey, I've been doing all this research and we built these models where we can track deer movement within 60% accuracy. And he's talking about whitetails. And he's like, I'm building this thing called Spartan Forge. I'm like, okay, um, this is cool, but how does this apply to us out west? He said, well, I think I can do the things that you're doing in Tag Hub. And I work with my development team and I think we can make it even better. Hmm. I said, okay, let's have some conversations. And so we started talking and we... Um, we built this partnership to build tag hub 2.0 and make it even better. Now the mobile is coming in November of 2023 and it is going to be phenomenal. Um, our last mobile experience, you could do the research. There are some charts you just could not view. Well, um, I yeah. was not happy with how that, how that looked, um, in and, tag and hub, wanted, you mean tag hub 1.0. Yeah. Yeah. Tag hub 1.0. Now in 2.0 in 2.0, um, we have, it is phenomenal. Like the mobile experience is going to be phenomenal. The beauty of it is there's an app that goes with it. It, It's available in the Spartan Forge app. Um, So you'll be able to look and research and and do everything you'd want to do with Tag Hub. But one of the gaps that we filled is now you can leave a waypoint when you're doing research and say on your desktop or even in the field, say you're, say you go over to Idaho and you are doing your elk hunt and you, you look and you're like, man, that's a big mule deer, but I don't know if my tag works here or if I need to figure out something different, see if it's a controlled hunt, that sort of thing. You can leave a waypoint right where it is, come back, get into Tag Hub, and it's now there. Oh, really? So That's interesting. Yes. Huh. Yeah, so we've been able to tie tie all this together and you can leave a little note on, on the waypoint. You're like, hmm, I need to do some research on this deer area that I looked at <laughs> while I was elk hunting. You can now go back and do that. We've tied them together um, where you're, you know, that system works and it works well. So all that, um, all that said 2.0, it has, it now has 3d maps. We did not have that in 1.0. Um, mm-hmm. We've been able to do some sliders, which will show you um, what are your odds? Like, so if you want to find areas that are 50% odds or better at, at the minimum points, um, we've got a slider there so you can watch them, you know, coming like the, they'll light up and then, and um, then go away. I did a lot of, I was using, uh, I was using through application season cause I was looking at the beta version before we were able to launch at the tail end of May with 2.0. Um, I was, lo- I was doing all my hunt research on 2.0, treating it like I was a customer and trying to walk through that system. You know, I was, and I've got applications in, um, Wyoming, Montana, and Nevada. So I'm, I'm hmm. prototypical of a lot of guys who are doing research. So I was using that to make my, you know, make my informed decisions. And I got tags in Wyoming and Montana. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, I, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn or anything like that, but I use the, I actually use this as a tool. 
um, to actually be able to hunt and do do good things. Now, now, you know, full disclosure, um, one of the hunts that I had in Montana was an outfitted hunt, but I wanted to know the details on where I was going to, you know, if we're going to drop that money on that, I want to know, you know, and so I was able to use, yeah. um, use tag of 2.0 to look at it. But for the first time ever, I was able to apply a 3D map. Um, and then here's another really cool part. In 1.0, we had, you know, we told you what the public land percentages were, mm-hmm. but tying it in with Spartan Forge, now we're able to actually, it's one thing to say you have 50% public land inside the MRS, but it's a whole other thing to show where that is and then be able to show all the roads that go with it. Yeah, the access so, points. That's that's what's tough, man, because there was a unit in Idaho I was looking at and it was it was like it was like 40, 50 percent public. But the access to get to this public land, most of it was landlocked by large, large chunks of landowners, you know, and, yep. and there was just like there was no way to get to that public land without having a helicopter. And um, I don't know if you know this or not, Scott, I don't have a helicopter. I, I did not know, man. I'm sorry you don't have a helicopter. Does Eastman's have one? They can borrow me every once in a while. Though. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dang Mike's it. got his pilot's license, and that's the closest. Uh, pilot's license for, yeah, for small planes. Single engine planes uh, kind of thing? Yeah. he's He's got, um I think he's got a dual engine rating, too, if I remember right. But anyway, all that just yeah. to say, no, we don't fly in on helicopters to public land or anything like that. Now, Dan Picard has done that once, but it was with an outfitter. Actually, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. That. And, I, I, I saw that video. Yeah. And it's It was an entertaining video. That's, that's, yeah, that's for sure. Certain. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, man. But uh, so that's, I mean, that's the, that is the meat and the heart of the research inside of Eastman's Tag Hub. But we said, okay, so if somebody's going to spend the money to be a part, uh, be an elite member with Eastman's Tag Hub. We also wanted them to get some of the traditional things. So the MRS and the magazines is not going away. It's still going to be there. It's just expanded because we, it, you're getting the same amount of content. It says we weren't able to put that in the magazine to begin with. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're giving you the magazine so you can read all the feature stories, but we've also got on tag hub, there's also exclusive blogs now. So we give, you know, we give blogs, like we, we put, we publish them every single week. Um, a lot of what's going on and things of that nature, but there are going to be some that are research specific that only tag hub members can see tag hub elite members can see. Um, then there's also a really cool feature. We started dropping episodes of Eastman's hunting TV on tag hub early. So if you don't, um, if you don't have, um, the outdoor channel on your satellite, um, just a lot of people have cut the cord. We put it there so you can see it on Eastman's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm one of those. There Eastman.com. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So you can watch Eastman's hunting TV. We also publish episodes of beyond the grid tv early as well so you can see those before they ever get published on youtube um, oh, see i didn't and, know that that's cool yeah it's it's a really cool feature we're actually uh, doing a real big push to let people know that that is there because we know a lot of you guys love to watch our content and if you had the ability to watch it early um you would you'd really enjoy it so yeah. um, that's yeah. a, a very important very important piece of the equation um and so all that all that just to say that's there. There's also the digital magazine. You still get the print magazine with it. The digital magazines are cool. You can pop it up and look at it on a PDF. It works really good on a tablet um, too. So that makes it really nice yeah. to be able to, to explore and look at that. Um, I, I still like the really- hardcover magazine though. I don't know. Uh, call yeah. me old school, man, but th- there's something about having the magazine and yep. I, I don't know if I'll ever get away from that, man. I don't know that I ever will either because there, there were a lot of magazines that i've read like hunting magazines that i read as a teenager that there's a lot of nostalgia with it yeah um, yeah i think that's I, what it is i think we have a generation that doesn't have an appreciation for for that kind of print stuff uh yep. and that's you know that it is what it is but for for uh guys like you and i who grew up on on especially eastman's hunting magazine uh yeah you know um there's no going away for that for i, I like to stack them up and just keep them you know 100 percent I definitely do that. Yep. And so, you know, uh, that you still get the print magazines if you are an elite member, if you have have the basic, you know, if you just want access to the research, that's the basic. Is you just get access to all the research tools. And we've had a lot of guys who had print subscriptions before subscribe to the mm-hmm. basic so they can get both, you know, and they, you know, they can do that. Um costs about the same to to do it to become an elite member. So usually I I talk them into into upgrading to elite at some point um if they call and talk to me for hunt research. Um, you know, 
talking through what they're doing. A lot of guys like to call in and talk through what they're doing research wise. So yeah. we got that. But then here's a really cool one that we actually j- just launched. Um, you familiar with the Black Ovis website? Yeah. Black Ovis store? Yeah. Um, if you are an elite member with Tag Hub, um, you get a 20% discount code. So, oh, um, really? That's a big deal. 100%. So, I didn't know yeah. that, man. And I'm a, I'm a member, I'm an elite member. Uh, pretty sure that's that one of my perks for being a week. Western Huntsman podcast guy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> or it is. Yeah, with Eastman's. Uh, oh, and. What about the online mule deer course? Does that does that come with 2.0 or is that still extra? Sometimes that's a different um, that's a different subscription. It's a one year subscription that you can get with that. However, um, one cool thing um, that we are doing right now is you're if you uh, subscribe to our you know if you've ever subscribed to our newsletters or anything like that, we're about to be sending out some offers where you can get the mule deer course and uh, Eastman's Tag Hub Elite membership for one forty nine ninety nine. So that's a, a deal that we're working on right at the moment. That's so that'll be, yeah, yeah. There, there's a ton of information. Brian and Dan and guy did a phenomenal job putting that mule deer course together. And so I think that, um, it's a fantastic opportunity to uh, look at and grow, um, grow with, with that. So there's, th- we're, we're basically, what we did is we give away a lot of free gifts. If you become an elite member, like I, I don't know how many, um, uh, how many Everly stock bino harnesses that we've had go out over the course of time. However, um, the beauty of it is, is that you get these, these cool free pieces of gear, depending on, you know, what offer we have going, we've given away a bunch of swagger bipods as a free gift. Mm-hmm. Well, we decided that, um, we're going to do the mule deer course and the uh, tag hub elite together for a while on a few offers. So I guess since I'm talking about this with you, yeah. I better put that up on the homepage, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, I'm, I'm on Eastman uh, or I'm all logged in. I just got all logged in. So it's, it's showing the tag hub elite membership plus free gift when hunting gear and gear discounts up to 35% off. I'm trying to find, find that. How do I access like the black Ovis? Wait a minute. What, what is this? Some of this, gear stuff you guys have put up there i haven't seen this the new anyway i'll i'll dig around see i can't i can't like research online here and talk carry on a conversation at the same time oh there's your smiling face right there wearing a pretty sexy hoodie there buddy hey i uh uh scott i lost your sound man I'm, I'm talking to myself here. I lost your sound. I don't know what happened to you, but I'll try to keep I'm here it. now. Oh, there you are. There you are. You're back. I, I know what I did. I bumped the mute button. So well, you are here by reprimanded. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've in the past, we've run the discount page, but that's going to be swapped out for the Spartan forge code. And occasionally we'll run a big discount. Like we ran a big discount with SIG. So that's a perk of being an elite member is you get access to all of those all discounts at different points and specialties. But the biggest one is, man, you have access to a 20% off discount. If you are an elite member, we sent out an email two weeks ago that has that code in it. Um, oh, so okay. look through your email, make sure you open up that email. Um, but we, um, we're we going to be, you'll see it on that. We're going to be putting it on the discount page next week. It's a planned marketing piece of the equation. Um, so be watching for that. In fact, that gives me a deadline too to make sure uh, that page gets updated as well. Well, uh, um, l- let me ask you this for for the sake of simplification on like the okay. whole tag point two point oh. What what are like some key things you want hunters to get out of it? Like, is there something that it simplifies for them? Is it is there uh, you know information they're not going to get anywhere else kind of thing? And and I yes. again I don't I don't want to make it sound like an infomercial, but like when mm-hmm. people think of tag hub. What are the, in their mind, what is going to be like huge benefit for them? The biggest benefit that you have for tag being a tag of member is you have access to 37 years of Western hunting knowledge, all put into the members, this expanded version of the members research section that is digital, that is sortable, and that is easy to use. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that is like the, it. that is the biggest advantage you get. Everything else is a perk. Um, we are constantly tweaking the perks because 
if you're going, if you are going to be an elite member, we want you to have lots of things to enjoy. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, we're going to continue to improve the perks. We're going to work on discount codes and make sure you see that. So it's on the, um, by the time this podcast comes out, the discount code page will be updated. It'll have the, for elite members only, we'll have the um, Black Ovas discount code there. Uh, sorry guys, I can't put that out over the airwaves because you know, have to be a member. Um, but the biggest thing is you have access to a research tool that allows you to in real time drop drop pins and go back and forth and be able to do research in the field where you have cell phone service. You can still, um, you know, you can see 3D maps. Um, that's not been a thing that we've had on 1.0. So you can actually take a look and really see all the different pieces that are there. This is, it's an important, um, it's an important tool that you will never leave home without um, once you start using it. Yeah. And just, just so people know, like Spartan Forge, what he had mentioned a little earlier there, that, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it, think Onyx base maps that that kind of program. I've I've had it on my I've got it it's on my phone. Very similar. Yeah, very similar. So uh, super user friendly too. Um, and and what we did with that is you know Spartan Forge told us they could house Tag Hub for us, so that's what we did. So they've housed our research tool. Yeah, and so. Um, and that's why the partnership works. They've housed the research tool, but we've been able to tie that, tie all of that together and make it a fantastic opportunity. I need, I need to get Bill from Spartan Forge on, man. We've, we've like tried a we couple do. of times and, and something always gets in the way and we can't record for one reason or another, but we'll, we'll get them on here sooner rather than later. Um, Absolutely. Well, Scott, what, what other hunts do you have this year? Do you have any good hunts still lined up or you are tell me a little bit about what your season's looking like now so i've actually got a ridiculously busy november believe it or not um i typically don't have a lot of hunts in november i know that for whitetail guys that's like the busiest month of the year oh yeah but oh I'm, yeah i've got a uh i've got a hunt in november um where i'm going to back up to montana um for a um to finish out my whitetail tag that I've got. It's and it's not a whitetail specific tag, but the hunt I'm going on is a whitetail specific hunt. Did you uh, say that's um, in Wyoming? No, that's in Montana. Oh, Montana. Um, okay. Yep. So I'm going to go finish that. I actually, I was there for a week of archery hunting, but I was filming Brandon. And so then if Brandon tagged out, um, I was going to be, I was going to hunt the second, whatever it was, whether it was a day or whether it was four days, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he ended up, uh, he ended up filling his tag. Um, and so that was kind of a, a, a challenge. Um, there was the, the, the buck jumped the string. Um, oh no. So, <laughs> yeah. It jumped, it jumped the string. So it was a far back hit. So it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge there. Um, but you know, we worked our tails off and that sort of thing, um, to, for recovery, all that good stuff. So end of the week, I got to do some, I got to be the one uh, shooting and, um, I had a really big buck, um, he stepped, he walking and I knew where the fence was. So I was waiting for him to get there. Cause I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to draw any attention to us. And I was at full draw. Um, and he had right in front of his vitals was a tree. So, Oh no. You know, had head, I had head right here, man, right. Here, and he's about to jump over the fence. I mean, he was paused at the fence and there was enough, you know, there was enough wind where, and I had everything perfect, you know, enough wind to cover us up. So he wouldn't have jumped the string, anything like that. And, I couldn't do it. And he was a big buck too. So that's too bad, um, man. That's going to hurt for the rest of the year. That happened to me, but it wasn't a big guy. Uh, I had a, I had a little raghorn come running into, uh, some bugling I was doing this last few weeks ago, you know, and, and this mm -hmm. guy comes running in, stops broadside. Vitals are completely covered by a, by a Tamarack. And I just, there was nothing I could do. Then he saw me, he saw me move. I kind of shook well, my head in frustration and he saw that and left. <laughs> So I'm lucky I get to go back and, and hunt this in this piece. It's close, close to the Missouri River. So I get to go do that. Oh, nice. Um, around mid, mid November, but I've also got a late season mule deer tag that's close to home here. Um, so I'm going to probably go out just about every, um, every day at minimum in the afternoons and go look over, um, you know, where I find the does and things like that. So that's, Ooh. you know, late season mule deer hunt. That should be fun. Um, it's a, they haven't offered this tag, um, very long. Um, so we'll see whether it's any good. Yeah. I don't know. No. Hmm. You know, so we'll, um, I don't know whether I'm going to, you know, be highly disappointed or whether I will be very, very happy with what I end up killing, um, there, but we'll see what happens. Um, so that's my November. 
I'll bet you. I'll bet you on the whitetail side. I'll bet you that it's a lot more active than last time you were there. It's crazy. I'm the The bucks that show up not. in November and in, in whitetail. What would you say? Yeah. I the our um the guy that we we were hunting with it's a it's a guy who's he's getting started with an outfit so we got invited up to go to see it and and spend some time there and 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 talk through what what um what his outfit looked like and he said he hunted the year before or last year during the rut and with that he said you know if I'm rattling on the ground for you guys you better wear your shoulder pads. <laughs> like these, like they killed a buck at 12 yards. Hey, I'm, wow. I'm looking, I'm looking in my phone for my invitation to this. I am not seeing it. Did you, did you forget to send that to me? Uh, I rifles apologize. ready. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, that's I great. Uh, no, I have, so, I, I have, I have a really good whitetail hunt coming up too. So dude, I'm pretty, good. yeah. Yeah. It's on the Idaho good. side. So it's, it's going to be good. I, um, Idaho's kind of a sleeper for whitetails. It's got some, it's got some good bucks there. Man, if if uh, if anybody's listening to this and doesn't follow a guy named Troy Pottinger, uh, I think his Instagram handle is Mountain Man Thirty Three or MTN underscore Man for Mountain Man Thirty Three or something like that. Anyway, th- this guy it, he is one of those guys. Like a lot of people know him, a lot of whitetail hunters know him, a lot of hunters in North mm-hmm. Idaho know him. But he's one of those guys. You know how we've got like these hunting heroes or, or whatever you want to call them. They're just real solid, you know, like a Dan Picard, Brian Barney, uh, kind of type real successful. This, this is one of those guys and he's real specific to mountain public land, whitetail hunters. Uh, yeah. and he, and he does, he gets it done mostly in Idaho, but he'll go to Montana and Washington even. Um, uh, but he's, uh, he's an absolute animal when it comes to mountain public land, whitetail. Mm-hmm. In fact, I need to, we keep threatening to get him back on the show. I need to get him back on the show. Yeah, um, sounds like he'd be a great guest. Oh yeah, he he's been on the show before. He, uh, I think twice. He is a great guest. And in fact, I have uh, I have Gabriel coming on tomorrow. Do to you talk. really? Oh yeah, we're gonna do like a school of November. In fact, by the time this episode's out, that episode might already be released. So hmm. we'll we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So absolutely, it's gonna be fun. For those of you who don't know, Gabriel was actually the guy who connected uh, Jim and I. So yeah, but- yeah. He's he's a mutual friend of both of ours. Yeah, he's such a good guy. I told him I told him to quit shooting all the elk so I can have a chance out here in Montana when <laughs> I start hunting Montana next year. Him and his wife both tagged out on nice bulls. So yes, they did. Well, okay, sir. I, I think I've kept you long enough here. Um anything anything else you want to let people know about uh, regarding Tag Hub or anything new coming out with the Eastman's hunting journals that people should know about before we cut it off here? Taghub.eastmans.com. Um, I believe I've got you set up as a, for a discount code. So if you hear it on the Western Huntsman, just use Huntsman at checkout. I, think, I can't remember what I did. It was like 15 or 20%, something like that. So you Good get deal. a um, get a discount if you heard it here on Huntsman's podcast. So make sure you um, you know use that as as you subscribe. Um, you can do it uh, monthly or annually. So $14.99 a month or $149.99 for a year. And you have access to everything I just talked about. Um, and if you have any questions, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to us, taghub at eastmans.com. Um, I, I directly get all those emails, so I'll answer them. Um, and man, keep sending us your stories. It sounds like it's been a good hunting season for a lot of people. So we want to, yeah. we want to see those and share those stories in the magazine. Heck yeah. Uh, the, the one thing that like, uh, what I would, what I would plug for tag hub for, for folks listening, if you guys are anything like me where you want to, especially if you want to go hunt out of state and and find some of those tags, and it, it might not be like a once in a lifetime tag, just a tag that maybe two or three or four points um, that, yep. that where you have really good, uh, you know, opportunities and, and uh, decent odds of drawing and stuff like that. I am like not a super detail oriented research kind of guy. I, I get really bored, very short attention span. I I'm, I'm better off just like calling Scott here and being like, Hey man, where should I get a tag? If, if you're like me in that way, tag hub simplifies the complicated. And, and that's what I like about it. Why I could, I could, I could just jump on there and in like 10 minutes, I, I have a really good understanding of what tags are within my grasp with what points I have. That's, that's what I like about it. It simplifies very complicated things or what in my mind in the past has always been really complicated. And it just like kind of does all the work for you. 
Um, like he yeah. said, like 37 plus years of information is in there. So it's, it's really handy for guys that are like me that don't want to sit and research for two, three, four hours a night for a week straight. Uh, cause it's just not my cup of tea. So check it out. Taghub.eastmans.com. All right, man. Thanks again for joining me. This was a lot of fun. I think, I think like we said in the beginning, we should do this more often. We should just kind of do like an Eastman's Absolutely. hunting journal update here, uh, on the Western Huntsman. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do this once a month. Well, if I don't talk to you, good luck on those hunts and keep me posted for sure. And uh, looking forward to seeing how they turn out for you, brother. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. You made it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're following us on Instagram at the Western Huntsman and write us a good review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you 